Thanks very much, Tal. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, it's been a bit of an adventure getting here. Um, I was in New York in my uh, deaning duties uh, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and um, was booked to come back on the train on, uh, on Thursday night, and it, it showed up about three hours late. Um, so I, I think I got to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, just uh, going in here. And um, so if I fall asleep during my own talk, um, um, <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> um, and then coming up here, we, we spent an hour parked in Alewife with a, a traffic accident, so it looked for a while as if I wouldn't quite make it. There'll probably be many of you in an hour's time wishing that, the accident, that I hadn't made it. But, uh, but here I am. So as Tal said, I, um, um, I, I became dean at the Divinity School about three months ago, which means I think uh, scholarship and writing will be uh, even more difficult than it was before, before that. But one thing that I'm hoping to do over the next um, several years is to work with Hugh MacLeod, the European social historian, on comparative secularization in Europe and the United States in the modern period. And we've got a few grants uh, together and, 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 and opportunity to bring scholars in to work in this topic really because we feel that there's a good deal more to be said about it. Uh, we don't quite know what that will look like, but we live in hope. So what I really uh, want to do today is just walk you through um, uh, this topic, um, um, uh, and here's the kind of outline of what I'll try uh, to say, just some preliminaries, um, uh, some interpretive lenses to think about this, this subject. And then I'll look at the 10 most common analytical frameworks that people have used to um, uh, compare and contrast European and American secularization. Um, um, and then uh, hopefully say something a, a little bit fresher, uh, the six developing perspectives that I think need more work, more attention, might yield some fresh insights, and then some uh, concluding reflections. So, um, um, some of the preliminaries then. Uh, almost all, by all measurements, um, um, uh, church attendance, uh, 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 belief value surveys, um, uh, 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 citizens of the United States come out higher in terms of their religious uh, adherence uh, uh, than Europeans. Um, so uh, uh, why and how does that happen? Five, or, uh, five preliminary things just to get out of the way. Uh, one needs to allow a little bit for the well-documented tendency of Americans to exaggerate their religiosity in these surveys, um, which is not, of course, a national characteristic, but it just happens on this particular thing. Um, but that in itself is an interesting phenomenon of, of why um, uh, people would choose to do that. Of course, one needs to allow for the difficulties involved in identifying, measuring, and determining religion over space and time. It's a very complicated subject. Are you measuring like for like? Uh, how does religion change? Um, um, does religion in, um, in, uh, in the Vendée in the 18th century look anything like it might look like in the Appalachians in the 19th century? Uh, these are very complicated issues. But also needs to allow for regional and national complexities. Um, a very distinguished European historian, Hartmut Lehmann, talks of the need for layered maps of religious topography over time in Europe to give the full sense of the complexity of how this works out. And you'll know that in more recent times in the United States, um, uh, um, scholars like Brett Carroll and Mark Silk have been arguing something similar, that we need a very sophisticated regional um, map of the United States before you can talk intelligently about its uh, religious structures. And there's also, I think, uh, that the de Tocco factor, what I mean by that is that it's sometimes easy to um, um, uh, make the comparison between the United States and Europe, but really making the comparison between the United States and France. And France is not Europe, really. It, it is. Uh, uh, it is in Europe, uh, uh, I think. Um, uh, um, I, I think there's some people who wish that it wasn't, but it is in Europe. Um, um, but, um, uh, but it's not the, the, the entirety. Um, um, and then fourthly, allowing for different religious discourses in Europe and America. Are we talking about the same thing? It's a very malleable concept. And a lot of work done recently by uh, David Hollinger and, and Catherine Albanese making this kind of point. And then finally, allowing for the fact that perhaps 
Charles Taylor and Steve Bruce may be right that Europe and the United States are now both secularizing, albeit in different ways and at different speeds. And um, uh, some of the work done by Robert Putnam, my colleague at, at, at Harvard on American youth co cohorts and the growth of nuns, non-affiliated um, uh, American youth over the past decade um, could perhaps lead you to believe that um, that, that uh, um, uh, uh, Taylor and Bruce opinion is, is correct. So a few interpretive lenses that I want to think about. The, the first is the usefulness and, and, uh, and the difficulties of comparative history, the problem of transatlantic competencies. One thing that Hugh McLeod and I have discovered as, we've, as we're trying to um, think of scholars to bring together for this collaborative exercise is that there are not many scholars either in Europe or the United States who are genuinely transatlantic. And uh, many people are uh, United States historians who look a little bit back to Europe periodically, or European historians who know a little bit about the United States, but not very much. There are not that many scholars who are really equipped to do this kind of work. In terms of um, another interpretive lens, I think I'll be making a case today for American distinctiveness, but not for American exceptionalism, which may seem to be um, a distinction without a difference. Um, but, um, and so if you push me hard on what I think the difference is, of course I couldn't tell you because I'm too tired. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there is, I think, uh, I think it is possible to say that there's something distinctive about the United States by comparison with Europe, but full-blown notions of American exceptionalism, I think, disguise that distinctiveness and force you down a path which I think is really not very helpful. Um, thirdly, secularization is an important working concept, but it has obvious problems associated with it and should not be the trump card in all the comparative exercises we do between the United States and Europe. There are alternative master narratives that people try to work with, and pluralism has become one um, of those master narratives. But um, 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 over the last couple of decades, I've been at various conferences in Europe where historians have gathered together to try and find an alternative term for secularization, something that has a more precise meaning, something that is more useful, and, um, or even to think of an alternative master narrative that might work better. Now, all of those um, conferences pretty well failed um, because secularization is a useful word, uh, even though it's not a very precise word. Um, and it's very difficult to think of something uh, better. And then finally, there are a number of people, I think, working along the idea that the real differences between the United States and Europe may be the accumulations of small differences over time um, that collectively add up to something different. This is certainly something that Charles Taylor's written about in his book, A Secular Age, that if you have a multitude of small differences aggregated then you have quite a large difference over time. Um, um, and there are also uh, uh, other historians uh, emphasizing ebbs and flows or negotiations that um, uh, David Hall and John Butler both argued that this is a, um, uh, that secularization in the United States is something that may not be on a teleology, but actually goes up and down a little bit and it negotiates with the culture. There's kind of um, a, a complicated picture. Um, so the perils of teleology and metaphorical construction, the problem with secularization and people's writing about it is that people often write in metaphors which, which begin to have a power all of their own. Um, if you read uh, uh, the book by Harvey Cox, my colleague at, at the Divinity School, Secular City, it's a book full of um, declension narratives or, or metaphors, declension metaphors that actually begin to have a linguistic life of their own. So those are the preliminaries. Here are the 10 most common interpretive frameworks employed by historians in Europe and the United States for trying to explain the differences between um, Europe and the United States. The separation of church and state, the differential role of social elites, the importance of immigration, um, commercialism, consumerism, and popular culture, religion and political culture, religion and the national pro project, the ubiquity of congregations in the United States, different kinds of modernities, um, different kinds of institutional carriers of secularization, and then the differential impact of the 1960s and 70s in the United States and Europe. So I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. 
The first is the separation of church and state, and this is the most common one, that somehow um, uh, the different patterns of church-state relations in the United States and Europe is really the key. Whereas Europe um, uh, hung on, clung on to its old established churches in the age of revolutions, uh, really to uh, religion's disadvantage. The churches are often aligned with conservative um, uh, political and social interests at precisely the time those interests are becoming less popular among uh, wider populations. This would be an argument in the French Revolution, for example. Um, so that somehow these established churches uh, don't have much energy. They're aligned with all the wrong forces, monarchy, aristocracies, um, social elites. Um, they're not very nimble. Even creating ecclesiastical parishes and new megacities are very difficult. I had a student who worked uh, for a long time on the infilling of Vienna and the, the stunning population inflows, the difficulties of coping with it, um, the um, uh, Catholic Church's inability to create new parishes and working class districts, even to raise the money for them. Um, uh, so this is an important um, uh, area to, to work on. By contrast, people talk about um, um, the separation of church and state and a parallel ushering in of a rage of voluntarism, or as Nathan Hatch has it, the democratization of American Christianity, giving um, opportunities for populist, especially populist evangelical movements to surge and grow. Uh, Methodist, Baptist, other groups are growing really very fast um, at precisely those times when the European established churches are running into biggest difficulties. And then uh, that is often linked and brought together with um, an, another kind of freedom, um, not only just freedom from the state and the state's interference, but the freedom of free markets. Um, and there are a lot of economic historians interested in religion who talk about um, um, uh, uh, American uh, uh, religion in these terms, that somehow the free market um, uh, competition, um, unrestricted uh, energy, uh, all of these really produces a much stronger result in the United States. Um, um, and then you, you, many of you will well know oh, that this is something that shows up in the writings of Adam Smith right from the start in The Wealth of Nations, who makes the point that um, a free market um, uh, religious systems would be more popular than state-driven ones. It's part of a bigger economic argument that Smith obviously... Um, and this has gone right through to Tocqueville, uh, Stark and into um, uh, Becker, uh, the Chicago economist, who also thinks that free markets, whether in education or in religion or in economics, all produce more popular, more competitive um, uh, structures. So that whole argument of freedoms, um, greater liberty, uh, less restriction from the state, um, and the importance of free markets is really quite a significant one. A second is the differential role of social elites. Charles Taylor, in his book, A, a Secular Age, um, argues that there are differential capacities of elites to construct a society's social imaginary. Um, and what he really means by that is that, um, is that uh, social elites have the, um, um, a disproportionate influence over constructing how societies think of themselves uh, moving forward. Um, and the argument that he runs there is that European secular elites have been much more influential than American secular elites um, in shaping the national religious discourse. Because in America, secular elites encounter stronger popular resistance. So what people at Harvard or Yale think about religion is not what people in the Midwest or the South think about religion. Um, um, Following on from that, um, uh, Taylor also points out that there are two varieties and trajectories of enlightenment. The um, predominant form of enlightenment in Europe is really what we might call the ideology of reason, whereas in the United States, it's really the politics of liberty. So there's different kinds of enlightenment discourses. And the first is more poisonous for religion than the second. Um, the ideology of reason coming out of uh, Voltaire and the French Enlightenment and the Encyclopedia and all the people contributing to that um, is a more powerful solvent of religious strength and enthusiasm than the politics of liberty, this idea of simply casting aside priestcraft or state churches or ecclesiastical taxation or whatever it might happen to be. 
And then Tal Howard has contributed to this in a distinguished way as well when, in his book, um, um, God in the Atlantic, where he, he talks about um, European critiques of the US from both the traditionalist right and the secularist left, that in the early stages in the 19th century, Europeans thought America was going down the wrong path religiously because it didn't have an established church to protect religion. There were many, many people in Europe in the 19th century, including Thomas Chalmers in Scotland, who really thought established churches were vital for the protection of religion, because since there was no free market in a sinful world, in other words, people are predisposed not to be uh, religious because of their sinful nature. Therefore, there needed to be some kind of extra force, the state, or something organizing religion that people could be absorbed into. It's a very, this is a very common 19th century view. Um, 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 but then it switches in, in the 19th century, as Tal has pointed out, that in the early part, uh, critiques of America is really from that side. Why d doesn't America have, the United States have a, an established church? It would be better for religion. Much later in the century, it actually switches. Um, the people on the progressive left in Europe think that uh, America has become too religious, um, and you get a different kind of... Uh, um, uh, 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 critique. And then finally, under this rule of social elites, there's a very fine book by Hugh McLeod, the person I'm partnering with, comparing three of the, the, the top six cities in the world um, in 1900. Um, um, uh, Berlin, London, and New York are three of the top six cities in the world by population in 1900. Um, and they have very, very different levels of religious participation. Berlin uh, church attendance is very low in 1900. It's around about 8%. Um, London is around about 25%. And New York is up towards 50%. There's a real difference even then. And um, Hugh ascribes that mostly um, um, to the differential impacts of middle and upper class elites on religious adherence. So he thinks that the German Enlightenment happens quite early and quite powerfully and affects the German working classes in cities like Berlin. Um, so th that, that difference is right there from, the, uh, uh, from early stages. So the role of social elites and how they play out differently in the, in, in the two land masses. Immigration and integration. This quote from Taylor, em immigration in different contexts yields different results. But in America, the process of integration has worked better, both historically and contemporaneously. So um, as uh, European migrants move across the United States, it's a very old um, idea, of course, but um, uh, that um, ethnicity and religion are mutually re reinforcing categories. So to be Irish is to be a Catholic, to be Polish is to be a Catholic, to be Italian is to be a Catholic, to be German is to be a Lutheran if you're from northern part, etc., etc. And this has been given some modern oomph through the, the writings of David Hollinger, who talks about, um, he thinks that Christianity in the United States is primarily ethnic. And what he means by that is that social solidarity comes from small and manageable units um, uh, in, into the wider society. And we could add to all of this the process of internal migration in the United States, a very fine book by Wallace Best, a, once a colleague of mine at, at, at Harvard, uh, now at Princeton. Um, where he talks about the great migration from the south into northern cities in Chicago, and that, that there's a, 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 even within internal migration, there seems to be something of a religious gain that comes um, from the organizing of, 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 of uh, uh, religious communities into new spaces. And this is followed right through into Hispanic, Asian, and other non-white immigrations in the modern period. Many of you will know that um, the Roman Catholic uh, 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 adherence and attendance figures are, um, are, look pretty stable in the United States now, but that hides a much greater truth that uh, it's really Hispanic migration that have pushed that up, whereas the old white Catholic um, communities are slipping back. Um, I won't say too much about the Martin thing at this stage. Um, so a fourth one, uh, commercialism, consumerism, and popular culture. And here is a whole bunch of historians who think that Americans are simply better at selling God than Europeans are. Um, and this, of course, is the title of Larry Moore's book, a really excellent book called Selling God. 
Um, um, uh, Patrick Allard has written about this as well. In other words, there's a constant innovation and experimentation in American society uh, 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 surrounding religion, whereas it's a rather more stable, uh, status quo-ish, old-fashioned, not very fast-moving, rather boring. Um, I mean, I was certainly uh, very aware when I came to the United States that the most exciting program in Britain on religion was Songs of Praise on Sunday evenings, which was really looking at lots of middle and older age people singing very old, very nice, but very old hymns. Um, 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 now, I can't really think that a program like that would hit the jackpot in the United States just yet, um, though, I, though I do know that Professor Dole has written very uh, well about the importance of hymns, but nevertheless, so selling God is constant innovation. Or even the Confluence of the Values, a very powerful book, again, by a colleague of mine, who's, um, at Bethany Morton, on serving God in Walmart. I don't know if you've read the book. It's, a, it's an interesting read. It's not entirely reliable. Um, but it's a, a, um, really what uh, she's arguing there is that there is a kind of confluence of values between the rise of a, a company like Walmart um, and, um, and a, a certain kind of business culture ideology, American patriotic values, servant leadership notions. It's a very well thought out book, brilliantly written, uh, stimulating and a little bit over the top. Um, um, and then finally, the reinforcement of religion in conservative American subcultures. Um, Steve Bruce, the British sociologist, makes this point that in the United States, um, um, it's possible in, uh, in, uh, in conservative subcultures to have almost a kind of sacred wall built about, uh, around religion. Um, uh, 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 people's church going, their television watching, um, their uh, news media um, absorption, um, their uh, school board involvement, their homeschooling practices. All of these have a way of almost creating a powerful subculture um, that's resistant to secular trends from outside in a way that is much more difficult in Europe, which is much more heavily centralized. French educational system, British educational system, um, uh, it works really very differently. Fifthly, and then religion and political culture. Um, this is a kind of interesting point, I think, that, um, um, that America has, or the United States has no real ancien regime to react against, except maybe the British state, and you got that sorted out in the revolutions. Maybe that was, was the ancien regime to react against. But after that, there's, um, so there are no church lands to secularize, which is the um, actual origin of the term secularization, to make secular, ecclesiastically owned lands. Um, so there are no ecclesiastically owned lands. Um, moreover, structural differences produce much less anti-clericalism in the United States and more socialism and social democratic movements in Europe. Um, so uh, Nathan Hatch has made the point that even when there is anti-clericalism in the United States, it's largely Christian anti-clericalism, um, whereas in France it's secular anti-clericalism, or in Britain it's secular anti-clericalism. So if you read those little, um, that little appendix to the democratization of American Christianity in the Hatch book, these little uh, collections of, of popular verse, and they're deeply anti-clerical, but they're very pro-Christian. Um, in other words, they don't like clergymen who are tax-grabbing um, fat cats um, who are just going around uh, servicing religious establishments or elites. Um, rather, it's more the kind of populist surge of Baptists and Methodists um, um, and, and other um, uh, uh, figures. And this is an especially important uh, uh, topic, I think, or subject, especially at critical moments of nation building in the 19th and 20th centuries. Because um, when it comes to emancipatory movements in European society, socialist, liberal, progressive, um, uh, these moment, movements are almost always anti-clerical or anti-religious um, in tone and in application. It's not universally true. There are emancipatory movements in Ireland, for example, uh, Catholic emancipation movements that are deeply Catholic, um, and that would be true in Poland as well. But on the whole, this is a, uh, this is a, 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 a statement that one can have some confidence in. 
Sixthly, religion and the national project. I think it's a really interesting idea that uh, David Martin, the very distinguished uh, British sociologist of religion, um, makes the point that when religion is closely tied to the national project, whatever the national project is, religion does better. So in Ireland, the national project is to get rid of British imperialism. In Poland, the national project is to get rid of permanently being walked over by Prussians, Austrians, or Russians. Um, um, and that's a national project. So, so Catholicism acts as social cement, as national identity, as a deeply powerful part of the national will. Um, now, Martin extends that idea to the United States and argues that the American national pro project is democratization, free markets, and liberal capitalism, and that uh, voluntaristic religion actually works quite closely with that national project. Um, so these values of, um, uh, actually work quite well. And I'll pass over with time moving on a couple of those uh, sub-points. A seventh um, point is the ubiquity of congregations and their social reach. According to Nancy Ammerman, the United States is really a federation of religious congregations. She, she guesses about 400,000, um, with tentacles reaching into every aspect of American society. So both her work, very extensive work on congregational surveys, and Mark Chave's work, also these grand um, congregational surveys, makes the point that American uh, religious congregations tap into almost everything. Choirs, Sunday schools, publications, um, voluntary, other voluntary activities, um, mission trips, um, mission, missionary organizations. Um, uh, in other words, we're not just talking about 400,000 congregations, but like a huge, what Putnam might call social capital or bonded social capital in each of those congregations. It actually sinks roots and tentacles into many, many other areas of life. There's nothing quite like that in European society. Um, established churches don't work that way. Um, the degree of uh, rooted networking um, extension into other things simply doesn't um, work as strongly. Moreover, Ammerman makes the point that the congregational impulse transcends its Protestant origins to include Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and other faith traditions. People who come to the United States and start religious uh, um, uh, congregations have to operate around the congregational impulse. There's no state money really to be had. Um, so even, um, uh, even religious traditions that are not accustomed to operating congregationally in Europe and other parts of the world have to learn how to operate congregationally um, in the United States. And then this point that Putnam makes that American denominations and um, um, uh, uh, um, represent multivalent expressions of ethnicity, class, and culture. There is a, 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 a American religious congregations tap into different ethnicities, different social classes, different cultural constituencies in ways that you can't really find in the same strength in, 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 in European established churches. Eight, religion and multiple modernities. And the point here is that when I was uh, you know, a, a, a younger scholar and had fewer gray hairs, than, um, uh, and the old idea that we grew up with is that modernity itself was, was, was something that was going to project secularization. It was something about urbanization, industrial culture, and uh, modern forms of living, insurance policies and companies, better medical techniques. All of these things would produce um, a more modern, less superstitious, less religiously dependent society, and that ultimately this secular gas would spread everywhere. It started in Western Europe, would move to the United States, and would more or less move to the rest of the world. And of course, people bought into this not just for scholarly reasons, but for ideological reasons. People um, uh, uh, who, uh, 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 on atheist traditions, who wanted religion to recede from the world order, felt that this was the great hope of getting rid of it, that modernity would sweep it aside. Now, these ideas don't um, stack up very well now, as you well know. Most historians and sociologists who write about secularization 
think that the real rogue in the, um, in the global secularization stakes is Western Europe. Everywhere else is relatively religious. So the United States is part of a wider world pattern. The, the odd person out is Western Europe. So secularization historians are now asking, so what was special about Western Europe? Why did it emerge in a secular condition rather than assuming that Western Europe was the first fruits of everything else? Now, that's a really radical shift in thinking. And if you don't remember anything else about this talk, and you won't, um, uh, that's the thing you want to hold on to. There's, some, there's been a radical shift in the way people think about this um, uh, a topic um, that, uh, that has changed everything. So, so if you do make that radical shift, how then do you start thinking about modernity? And here people are trying to reparse, recalibrate, think again about what modernity might look like. And people like Eisenstadt and others are, are arguing that American can be both religious and modern when modern is parsed in different ways. For example, the United States is self-evidently technologically sophisticated, but, per, but probably in its educational system, not scientifically well-informed. So you can have a modernity that is um, uh, sophisticated on one level and relatively unsophisticated on another level, um, um, uh, uh, which I think is a really interesting way of starting to think about this. And then institutional carriers of secularization. I won't spend too much time on this, but um, I do think there's a lot more work needs to be done on this paradox that religion is constitutionally kept out of US education and other public institutions, but infuses all aspects of public life and discourse. And something like the reverse is the case in some parts of Europe. How does this work? How does the, um, how does the judiciary, the educational system, the media, and welfare systems um, how do they carry the DNA of secularization, or how do they resist it? I mean, growing up, I was part of a, 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 a in the United Kingdom of an enforced um, re religious part of the school day, where you had to go into an assembly and have half an hour of Christianity um, um, in various forms. And I can honestly say that that was one of the great um, um, I mean, if anything was going to make Christianity unattractive, those school assemblies really made it unattractive. Um, it would be hard to work at it, making it more unattractive than they made it. Um, so, so sometimes Americans look across and say, well, you know, at least in the schools, you're allowed to teach um, uh, re religion or Christianity or what it might, might happen to be. But really, if you, had, if you were a consumer of that, you wouldn't think quite so much of it, actually, I can assure you. Um, and then finally, the comparative impact of the 1960s and 70s. Um, this is a kind of interesting topic because um, until recently, uh, certainly European historians thought of secularization as a, as a long, slow, steady decline. Um, but um, a, a lot of uh, historians and sociologists are now saying that it looks more like a cliff, that it's actually relatively stable up until the 1960s, and then boom. Um, um, so, uh, 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 so a cliff rather than a slow, steady decline. And the historian who's uh, written about this most creatively is Callum Brown, who published a very famous book called The Death of Christian Britain, not just the dying of Christian Britain, but the death of Christian Britain. Christianity in Britain died one day, according to Callum Brown, quite specifically one day. It was, I think, a release of a Beatles LP or, 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 or the extensive use of uh, contraception or whatever. But there was a day, um, and of course, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, tongue but what he really means by it is something quite radical happened in the 1960s. Um, the generational um, um, uh, transmission of Christianity was seriously interrupted by a generation uh, one of the first generations in British history that repudiated the values of their parents and ancestors uh, quite decidedly. Um, but women and first wave feminism uh, going off to college, the available of contraception, the available availability of pop culture, um, of uh, drugs, of uh, different forms of social behavior, um, of different um, um, uh, forms of sexual behavior. Um, so, and especially women, um, um, Brown really makes the point that 
women had been the main transmitters of religious values in the, in the British Isles. And in 19, around about the 1960s, that began to give way. So for Brown, the 60s is really a big thing, and it is a cliff face. He thinks it died in the 1960s. A lot of work coming out, of, uh, predictably, in the past three or four years, arguing that Brown overstated it massively and that religion is surging back in the UK and so on and so on. But anyway. Um, now, Bob Putnam, as you know, this American Grace book, uh, Harvard um, um, social scientist, uh, the person who wrote Bowling Alone as well, um, uh, the point he makes about the 60s and 70s in the United States is that the 60s was indeed, like Britain, a shock. Same kind of thing, Vietnam, Vietnamese war and protest, drug culture, sexual promiscuity. The same kind of thing hit the United States. But unlike um, um, uh, Western Europe, there was actually a fight back, moral majoritarian conservative religion strongly mobilizing against that liberalization of society. And um, so uh, Putnam argues that there was the shock of the 60s and then there was the aftershocks. And one of the aftershocks is a, is a very vital um, uh, reformulation of conservative religion in the, in the public sphere and in the private sphere. And McLeod has argued something similar in his book on the 1960s and 70s, where he argues that the shock of the 60s has really created two Americas, a conservative religious America and a more liberal progressive America, and that that gap has grown, more, uh, has grown wider. Um, so how you see the importance of this decade of the 1960s is really, really important. It's an important subject for historians of American Catholicism as well, who have very different views about Vatican II. Um, some historians uh, embrace the modernity of Vatican II and think it's a good thing. Others think that it really is a secularizing device. And still others think that the worst possible pattern is a liberalizing trend, which then becomes conservatively blocked up again, um, which is what has happened in, or uh, what the papacy has tried to make happen in American Catholicism. And they think that's the worst pattern because people are given these kind of signs and signals and, and then they're closed back up again. But however you parse that one, the 60s and the 70s, everyone thinks is really an important uh, way of thinking. So, so those 10 things are, are really the, um, I think the most common framing devices of, um, of the differences between European and American secularization. I want to spend a little bit of time now uh, looking at six perspectives that are already gaining more attention or that merit, or that merit more attention. And then these um, wonderful grants that we've got, hopefully we can give them some more attention. The first is the discourse of secularization itself. Second, follow the money. Third, demographics and fertility. Fourth, comparative trajectories of evangelicalism, religion and popular culture and religious morphing. So the discourse of secularization itself in the United States, secularization discourse has often acted as a warning against religious decline or as a catalyst for religious renewal or revival movements. Those of you who worked on these movements in the past will know that coming out of Puritanism, the Great Awakenings, Methodism, then into holiness traditions, then into Pentecostalism, these movements are all, almost all presaged on the fact that the old movement has gone to the dogs and something new and powerful is needed. Puritans didn't like the Church of England. Um, uh, people involved in the First and Second Great Awakenings thought that colonial religion was dead in the water. Um, uh, um, people uh, who thought that Methodism was a great thing in the 18th and 19th century then thought it had become mid-Victorian bourgeois, start moving into holiness traditions and healing traditions. Uh, people who thought that those holiness traditions were dull and dreary, and, um, uh, you know, morphed into Pentecostalism, and so on and so on and so on. So that the, the, this, the discourse of secularization almost promotes something grander, um, um, whereas many people writing about the discourse of secularization in Europe take a reverse view. European publics, including religious leaders, have interiorized the mainline secularization story of steady, steady decline and adjust accordingly, which then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can remember growing up and uh, watching uh, these uh, religious TV, TV programs or bishops wheeled in to talk about religion. Um, and, and they almost all said the same thing, you know, well, the tide of history is going against us. Um, young people are not interested in church any longer and there's nothing we can do. 
um, and so on and so on. It's a very kind of sonorous kind of sense that um, social mores were changing and they couldn't do anything about it. It was just the way it was. And, and in a way, it gave them permission to decline um, um, because it wasn't their fault. I mean, seriously, I think this was a very powerful idea that it wasn't their fault. The social climate had changed. They weren't in control of it. They couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't turn it around. It was game over. Um, and that's a very powerful, different tendency. So working out how that discourse of secularization works, I think, is a really interesting uh, way to think. Follow the money. Um, now, um, here, um, Jeff Cox, who's one of America's most distinguished historians of, of, of secularization, has made the point in recent articles that one of the big problems with Europe was that it was saddled with a lot of plant, uh, deteriorating plant in the, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. Churches with holes in their roofs, with stained glass windows cracking up. Um, um, uh, so just enormous number of old parish churches that were falling down. And that just the sheer energy involved in keeping those things stabilized, um, you know, the raising of the money, the preservation trust, the, you know, this absorbs such a powerful amount of energy in European religious culture, which is just what he calls institutional maintenance, um, rather than something more, I mean, it's something like what the United States will now, is now facing with its infrastructure. It's much easier to build those highway systems and maintain them. It's much easier to build uh, bridges and structures than to maintain them. We're, not, we're now in a phase in the United States where maintaining the infrastructure is helping to kill the American economy. Um, so these are big things. Now, if you compare that to the United States, I had a student who did a wonderful research project on how churches were financed in America's first industrial city, Lowell in Massachusetts. And what you come up with there is a far more flexible, dynamic way of capitally funding religious enterprises, and um, banks, stocks, mortgages, investments, debt, popular participation. Um, there were dozens of ways of getting money to make these churches work, whereas European churches often had to go with begging hands to government and said, Oliver Twist, like, can we have more, please? And European states said almost always no. Even Thomas Chalmers went to the British Prime Minister, uh, Robert Peel, and said, look, can I have more money? Um, and he said, no. And then precisely, and then proceeded to give quite a lot of it to Maynard's College in Ireland, <laughs> which I don't think uh, uh, British evangelicals liked. Um, um, so following the money and even putting that through into mega churches and growing the business and prosperity theology and new corporate methods, and of course, there are many economic historians in the United States who think there's a theory behind this. Economic historians always think there's a theory behind this. It's not just happenstance. And the theory, according to Yanakoni and Bowles, is that mar market forces shape religious outcomes. Competition works in religion. And then I won't read out the full quote because time's not on my side. But that um, it's really got to do with marginal costs and investment and religious finance. In other words, churches behave more or less like businesses. And if they operate financially that way, they're going to succeed. Whereas if you go the other way, the prospect of state support and the threat of state per persecution trust transforms religious firms into rent seekers, right? So there, there's a theory behind this. The kind of economic and financial model actually kills or boosts churches. Thirdly, demographics and fertility. Now, I don't know why. I have some sneaking reason, uh, uh, but I don't, do not know why uh, United States historians have not worked on this in more detail. Um, and I think it goes to the weaknesses of social history in the United States by comparison with Europe. And, the, and, by com and, and, and Americans have got stronger cultural history than Europe. And I think that academic divide affects the way this works. So the only really good paper I know on this has really been published by the Max Planck Institute in Germany, um, though I'm sure there are things I don't know about, but there's not a lot of it. Um, and the, the points that are made in this Max Planck Institute paper are that American women are more religious than European women, whatever the means of measurement. And I've gone to a lot of trouble to look at European value statements. It's a very big database. So American women are more religious. For the past two centuries, American fertility rates have been higher than European fertility rates. Um, 
that's still true. And within America, religious conservatives, Catholics and evangelicals, have higher fertility rates than the more liberal mainline denominations. So the cumulative impact of this is really very substantial. Um, um, so work it out, you know, um, um, and, uh, and the same points have been made by historians looking at transmission within religious traditions, the effectiveness of generational transmission. Jeff Cox thinks that the Baptists have been miles better at this than the Methodists, which is why they're so much stronger now in the American South than the Methodists are, at least one of the reasons. So Democrats, and I'd like to see this worked on a bit more, but it's potentially a big thing. Um, um, I mean, you only have to look, I think, at you know, even these presidential elections, and you see these um, you know, um, images of Mitt Romney with his five sons and however many, many, many grandchildren, but there is Mitt sitting there in front of this army of people. <laughs> um, uh, 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 too bad most of them can't vote because um, they're too young. But, um, uh, but, um, uh, but, uh, but there's another example of a religious tradition with very high fertility rates uh, historically, um, which is a part of the reason for, for its growth. Trajectories of evangelicalism, comparatively the trajectories of American British even, uh, conversion of evangelicalism over the long term are much stronger in the United States than they are in Europe. Baptist, Methodist, Holiness, and Pentecostal traditions, another populist tradition, are much stronger here than in Europe. And I think that in itself um, uh, calls forth one of the really big differences um, between the two uh, land masses. Then religion, popular culture, I'll need to move fast here. But why has religion sunk deeper roots into American popular culture than is mostly the case in Europe? From George Whitfield and his association with Benjamin Franklin and newspapers to talk radio, from media personalities um, uh, to controversial uh, incidents, um, um, uh, American religion seems to sink deeper roots into popular culture. And conversely, why has European religion become much less innovatory? There was a time when many new religious movements were birthed in Europe. Puritanism, Methodism, Salvation Army, um, a whole range of movements, Quakerism. Um, um, uh, I can't think of a single really powerful religious movement that's been birthed in Europe and transferred to the United States since the Salvation Army. So why is that happening? What has changed in the, um, in the, in the picture of that? Then this is a little bit of a complicated point and my brain is beginning to sink. Uh, religious morphing, um, and this point of, of Hugh McLeod that religion has this capacity to slide into something else um, um, and um, uh, there's a lot of interesting recent work, in, 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 in especially in the periodical literature in the United States, arguing uh, this is um, um, the work by the, the works by Modern, Albanese, and Hollinger, arguing that there's probably something different going on in the United States that what people come uh, describe as combinative uh, uh, transitions that allow people to morph. Uh, religious traditions into something else in a really kind of almost seamless way that retains a degree of, uh, of popularity. So just some concluding reflections then, um, as our time is pretty well gone. So I would really like to, to look at those six things again and see what they really add up to uh, cumulatively in, in, um, uh, in factoring into the, into the debate. So a few concluding reflections. Um, Taylor, again, has, it's a book worth reading if you really want to get a handle on this, A Secular Age. It's really, it's twice as long as it needs to be, um, but it is a good, it is really a good read. Um, he, and he has this phrase in the middle of it somewhere of the importance of historical shadows of long-term factors and national traditions, which over time produce quite different outcomes. The, and this is another way of arguing for the accumulation of small differences fertility rates, political cultures, um, consumer patterns, separations of church and state, all of these things, just add them all up and you're beginning to get a different pattern. Um, and I think there, uh, I have separated this talk out into these one, two, three, but these things all relate in complex ways. They're much more 
uh, interconnected than the separation for clarity would lead you to believe. Be a bit careful of the ideological and propagandist uses to which theories of secularization can be put. So um, uh, people will argue that uh, lower fertility rates is um, a, 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 a itself a product of religious decline and one of the great things to be wary of in the modern world we live in. I heard um, um, uh, Becker, the Chicago um, economist, speak at Boston University arguing that Adam Smith was a, a perfect model, not just for the Chicago School of Economics, but for religious traditions. Um, so it actually get linked to an ideology. So overall, what I'm arguing here, I think, is a case for American distinctiveness over these um, you know, manifold areas we've looked at, but not for American exceptionalism. I think it would be very difficult to prove that, um, that for some of the things we've been talking about, that you wouldn't have some European version of it somewhere, um, or that in the United States that there isn't some region that looks a bit more like parts of Europe than others. I mean, Steven Pinker's recent book on violence, for example, makes it very clear that the patterns of violence, death rates, are almost exactly the same in New England as they are in Old England. But New England is very different from the Midwest and the South, and so on and so on. So we may need to have much more delicate maps, religious maps, topographies. And this brings me back, maybe in conclusion, to Hartman Lehman's point that Maybe when we're doing the history of secularization and religion, we almost need to do, I remember going to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston once, and they reconstructed an old fallen down ancient city with a whole bunch of computer overlays. You know, here is the foundations, here are the walls going up, here are the streets, here are the people, here's the, and so on, until you had a thriving city. And I do think that there would be good reason to have topographical features of religion piled on top of one another like that. Um, if you were to look at France, for example, the patterns of, of Reformation and Counter-Reformation get played out again in the French Revolution. Those old layered maps of how religion inter uh, works um, um, are really quite important. Anyway, I think we'll call it a day with that, actually. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>